I heard this is the first family camp that everyone's having. Okay, so, yeah, so, okay, so we'll have fun figuring things out, right? Because uh, we, we need to figure out how, how we go about doing this and all that. Okay, I thought I was the last one to wake up or something because when I went down for breakfast, there was nobody around. <laughs> and then later I saw Milka and then <laughs> she said, where's everyone? And, th and of course, uh, when I got out of my room, I saw Cedric and Milka, uh, sorry, Cedric and Emily and then they, and they said they were going around waking everybody up. <laughs> so I figured everyone's off to a, a kind of slow start today. But uh, it's okay. We'll, we'll, again, we'll figure things out as we go along. All right. Okay, so we're going to get ready to have our first session. And just as soon as I can kind of get organized over here. Just try to get used adjusted to the lights here because it's a little dim, but anyway. Okay, uh, over, uh, Cedric, oh sorry, um, <coughs> no Cedric, um, Dale may, you may want to decide whether you want to keep, use two mics or one mic uh, during the preaching, but I, 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 will, I will be holding on to this, so yeah, so, so you might, no, no, it's okay, it's just that you might want to mute it or whatever. No, if you mute it here, whoever comes out and uses this may not know how to switch it back on. Yeah, just leave it. I th uh, yeah. Yeah, you mute it from... That was what I was tr trying to say. <laughs> but thanks, Cedric. Uh, I mean, thanks, uh, Dale. Okay. Why do I keep getting Dale and Cedric mixed up? This is, this is scary. <laughs> it's very scary. No, oh, it must be, I know, the silky rich voice that both of them have and make the ladies melt. Uh, so, Millie, now we know. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, welcome to the camp. And we, as we begin, let's open our Bibles and we will be in the book of Ruth. Okay. Yes, so make sure you're in the book of Ruth because if you're not there, then you are ruthless. <laughs> okay, and that's not a good thing. Okay, so we're going to be in the book of Ruth and uh, we'll be in chapter 1. Okay, and uh, let me see. I So we'll be in chapter one, and let's do this. Um, <coughs> I was thinking we'll, we'll do we'll do some Bible reading, and let's get things going. In okay, we're going to read the first eighteen verses. All right, first eighteen verses of Ruth. And they're very important. So let's all stand and I'll respect for the reading God's word. I'll we'll read this responsively and I'll begin with the first verse. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And Malon, Malon and Shilion died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And 
The Lord grant you that you may, you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. All right, may God bless to us the reading of his word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for even bringing us here, for giving us a night of rest. And Lord, even yesterday, a, a break, even after the conference. Lord, we thank you for uh, refreshing us. And Lord, as we come here this morning, as we begin the camp, I pray, Lord, that you also refresh us through the ministry of your word. And that by the teaching and the preaching of your word, that, Lord, you will minister not only truth, but it will search us out, probe deep into the most hidden and hardened places of our lives, to reveal your truth to us. Lord, to reveal truth that we may not want to be confronted with, nor acknowledge. And then, Lord, I pray and ask for your grace and your mercy also to help us to be responsive to that truth. I pray and ask also for your Holy Spirit to empower me that as I do this as I preach these next few days Lord that it will be with Holy Spirit power we ask that you remind us stir our hearts Lord that we will be ready to yield to you to be tender hearted ready for what you have for us and I ask Lord that the Holy Spirit will just deal with each and every one of us and that Lord you know so many things in our lives <coughs> that we need to deal with that needs to be set right to be set in order and that's why we have your word use me as your instrument or help me to step aside that you may take over and Lord that this camp will be spiritually very fruitful for each and every one of us and also father have your way with us we ask this in christ's name pray amen please be seated <coughs> all right we're going to begin in ruth chapter one and as we deal with this i want us to consider what is happening here this is a book where ruth this, right, this gentile woman, Ruth, is the main character in this book. This historically is during the time of the judges. And during this time, we see Ruth and then another main character, Naomi, is featured here in this in these four chapters. Now, they are going through, this book documents their journey in life, right? 
in this family. And what is significant about Ruth is that she is one of the four Gentile women that are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. In particular, what I find interesting about the women that are mentioned, because if you look at the genealogy, you know, it's always, uh, you know, Adam begets so and so, so and so begets so and so, so and that, right? And then we, most of us, when we do our Bible reading, we will just skim through the whole thing and then we move on. Okay? And, and then we have now from Abraham so and so to so and so, so, so and then so and so forth. Now, how many of us ever noticed that there were four women mentioned? Okay? Now, how many of us ever noticed that of all four women are Gentile, not Jews? It's very interesting, isn't it? They're not Jewish. And then, you notice that um, in the case of these women, all of them pretty much are what we in church would describe as bad women. Right? Tema who are uh, in seeking an inheritance and a descendant tricked, deceived and seduced her own father-in-law, Judah, from which that child onwards would actually carry the would be actually an ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you have all right, Ruth, okay, from Moab. The Moabites were known again, notorious. The Moabites women were notorious for their ability to be seductive and uh, Israel in the while they were still wandering in the wilderness, what happened? They gave in to fornication. Right? These were the descendants of the children of Lot who were again came to being because both the daughters of Lot seduced their father, got him drunk, then they got themselves pregnant. Um, before entering into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb, they actually, what did they do? Uh, was it Joshua and Caleb? No, the spies went out there, sorry. And two, and two spies went out there and they were sheltered by a woman, Rahab, a harlot. She's a woman of the night. All right? She makes her money through immoral means who had come to put her faith in the God of Israel. Knowing that her city and all her people were marked for destruction, trusted in the God of Israel that, and in return, she and her family were promised salvation. In fact, she became the great, great, I think it was like the great, great grandmother of King David. Again, in the family line of Jesus Christ. All right. Oh, wait, wait, there's one more. Bathsheba. Another woman who got involved in a terrible sex scandal. And then lost her son, her child. But then God granted, gave another child who would become King Solomon. Again, in the family line of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but even just reading casually through the genealogy, and when you look at these four women, all right, who are not of the okay, of the family of Israel. And the only time the women were mentioned, they were involved with something bad. But do you see a picture of redemption? Of second chances? And I want, as we begin, I want us to see here that no matter what you and I do, right? And sometimes how badly we mess up. 
that we have a God of second chances who is able to restore us and bring us back to where we are fruitful again and where we can be in the middle, the center of God's plan for our lives. And more importantly, to be in, inside and part of His plan. Not just His plan for us, but we are part of His plan. And as we begin, what we, I want us to realize here is that you and I will have to make our choices. But how will you and I choose? All right? As we look at chapter 1, I want to just kind of entitle this, Ruth Renouncing Her Old Faith. Okay, Ruth renounces her old faith. And if you look at verse 1, what I want to talk about first is the spiritual climate of Israel. You notice how the book begins. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the land, in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Okay, now, it says, in the days when the judges ruled. Now, can anyone tell me, when you, in your study of the book of Judges, now what did you notice about the book of Judges? What was the key verse? It's repeated a number of times throughout the book of Judges. What was that? In those days, there was no king. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Right? In those days, there was no king. Why was there no king? Because God had intended for him to be God, to do, him to be the king. All right? God will be the king. God will be the one who will give his laws and we will obey his laws. But those days, this is the no king. But what did they do? Instead of following God's laws and his commandments, right? and it was laid out in, in the laws of Moses that were already given to Israel, what did they do? They set that aside and they became the law. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. I become God. I decide what is true. That's humanism. That's the chief religion in Israel in the time of the judges. Now, Ruth and Naomi live in those times. And here it tells us that there was an incident. There was a famine in the land. All right? Now, a famine would tell us that there, there will be a shortage of food, the crops would have failed, there may be whether it's because of a drought or whatever, but either way, the circumstances are bad. Now, when those circumstances are bad, what happens? The economy will be affected. Now, I'm trying to link that up to where, where most of us would be, you know, because we see this happening in our times. All right? People are fearful sometimes of uh, where, where things are, how the economy is going, wh whether it's good or not. You know, we will vote a politician on the basis of whether they will give us, help us have a good economy so that we have jobs, we are prosperous. But here, what we, what we see is that because of the famine, right, it tells us there was a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, who decided it was time to go elsewhere. It was time to pack up move our family to some other place for better prospects. I don't know why you are here in Cambodia. But in most cases, I think it's safe to assume that if you came here because of a job, it was for better prospects and you left home to come here. It is never easy to leave home. Right? We leave our friends, our family, we leave behind our church. All right? We leave behind many things that are comfortable to us. And we come to a new place where we are strangers. All right? Where we are foreigners and, and we have to adapt all over again and we have to settle all over again. It's never easy. It's even more difficult when you are married and now if you were to move, it's not just you yourself. It's easy when we are single. When you have to move, and what happens now? Your wife has to adjust. All right, your children have to adjust. And there's so many changes. Sometimes the difficulty is uh, what happens if you move and you don't make the right decision, uh, it wasn't quite the right decision, and you have to fix that, and you have to move again, and you have to move again. And what happens is that um, it can have a very bad effect on members of the family. 
some years back, I cautioned someone about making too many rapid moves, but he went ahead and the wife is suffering depression right now. Okay? But he's finally acknowledged that he understood that, you know, it was his pride. Now, here, I want us to see that the reason was given to us in verse 1. Right? There was a famine in the land. And so what happens? This man of Bethlehem, Judah, decided he was going to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now, the idea of sojourning is, was, has, carries this implication that it was not intended to be a permanent move. Okay? We just go over, write out the famine, or these days write out the economic recession. When things get better, We'll come back. So, this was not a meant to be a permanent decision, but at the same time, I want I will put it to you that this was not a faith decision. How do we know that? Because God had always intended for the the children of Israel to settle down to live where in Canaan. The place was clear, right? It was called the promised land. God had promised that land to them. This is where they were supposed to be. Now, understand this. Because the circumstances change, right? there is a famine, we need to realize as, as His children that just because circumstances change, because circumstances become more difficult or harder, it doesn't mean that God's plan, design, or will for us has changed. Amen. Now, it could be, right? Maybe you have a visa difficulty, you have financial difficulty, whatever. It, now, just because those things change doesn't mean God's plan has changed. Now, we, what we have to ascertain is this. The, what is God's plan? If that is His plan, right, that is His will for us, when did it change? If it did not change, then the question, then the issue will be, we stay until He, in, he indicates to us it's time to move. Amen. Now, this will not be unfamiliar because what you're going to see is that even a spiritual giant like Abraham made that mistake twice. Twice. Because of a famine, what happens? He moved. When he moved, the first time he, got, he went into Egypt, got into trouble. He knew he should not have moved there. He knew before he entered the place, he told his wife, Sarah, says, you know what, uh, this is not a godly place, this is not a good place, but if we move here, the one of the things that's going to happen is that the men of, uh, there are going to eye, have their eyes on you and they may kill me because when they find out that I'm your husband. So he said, please lie to them, just say we're brothers and sisters. What happened? Sarah was recommended to Pharaoh. Pharaoh took her, and she was quite old, remember? But he took her to be his wife, and guess what happened? God had to deal with this matter himself before sending Abraham and Sarah away. He had to learn that lesson twice. Wait, 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 hang on. You know what happened? Isaac had to learn that lesson again, one more time. And so what I want, want to see here is that circumstances do not decide how we should make the decisions. All right? It was not a faith decision, nor was it out of faithfulness. If it was out of faithfulness, they would have stayed where they, right where they were. Okay? In those days, because this was the time of the judges, there was also not only a famine or, or as far as a shortage of food, there was a famine concerning the word of God and his authority. That's why Judges 17 verse 6 tells us, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. All right? No final authority except man himself. So, you see, the, at the heart of pragmatism is this idea and philosophy that whatever works for me must be right. You get that? Whatever works for me, whatever works for us and our family, whatever works for our church must be right. 
And so because there is a positive outcome, that validates whatever we're doing. All right? There is no need to consult the Word of God because if it works for us, right? Maybe it works for us, our church budget is good, you know, um, we're growing, we have a big attendance. It must be correct. That's pragmatism. And, and it is a very toxic substitute for the Christian faith. Okay? Because God is no longer the authority, man is. Man has replaced God at the throne. Now, and this was moving away, this, as I mentioned just now, despite God's promises, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 2, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, notice, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God shall set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and those, all those blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. All right, and so and Israel was told to stick with God's word, keep to it. All right, and if we will honor God's word in our lives, in our decisions, He will honor that nation. There was pragmatism behind the behind the decision to move on. All right, it was not based on principle, but on feelings, comfort, inconvenience, lifestyle choice, and and so what happens? This man packed up, took his wife, his two sons. They left everything behind. They sold whatever they had. Okay? Notice they left no roots in Israel. And they left. Very often when that happens, you know, uh, when a decision comes like that, rarely is this something that people pray and fast over. Rarely do we seek the counsel okay, of a multitude. And I'll, I'll just say, say why. Usually, the pastor is the last to know. You know why? If he's the first to know, we are afraid that he might actually talk to us to change our minds. And we don't want anyone to change our minds. We want to announce what we have already decided because we have figured out what was right in our own eyes and we went ahead. Okay? Now, people know that I don't impose my own will or my own thinking on others. I help them try to arrive at the decision on their own, but they don't want to talk to me in many cases because they're afraid that I would actually have to give them the counsel of God's word and that's not what they want to hear. Why? Because, again, pragmatism dictates already that I am the one who will be able to figure this out and then I know what's best for me and whatever works for me is the best. Never mind God's word. All right? And we have to realize here that it is and features so many times in everything that we do, right? Uh, with regards to uh, whether to leave a marriage, to leave a family, to leave a job, to leave a, a church, to move to another country. And the bottom line argument and the thing that people are looking for is this God wants, is that this idea that God wants me to be happy. What about faithfulness? All right, think about this. The move to uh, all right, the move to go to Moab. How can it be God's will for someone to move to a place where there is no way that you can worship God? And yet we see this in the Philippines all the time. Someone come up and say, Pastor, I'm going to take a job where? Saudi Arabia. There's no church there. It'll be a miracle if you can smuggle your Bible in. How can it be God's will unless the Lord is sending you to start a church? You see, God doesn't contradict His will. And, you know, the place that He wanted His people to remain or stay was in Israel. But now they move 
And this man made the decision to pack up with his wife and his two sons. Why? Because there was a famine. Hang on. Do we not serve a Lord and Savior that was able to feed 5,000? And that was just 5,000 men. We, we weren't even counting the women and the children there. 5,000 men out of what? Just a bunch of loaves and a few fishes. Okay? So, this was a... I, so, the second thing I want to notice here, the pragmatic decision on Naomi's family. Right? Because this moving away is against, despite God's promises. Now, Deuteronomy 8, 1 and 2 has this to say, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord. Wait, hang on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God shall set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. Right? And the, these blessings shall come. Okay. Come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Okay? Now, I think I've read that verse a second time, actually. Never mind. Now, there was... So here we see there was a pragmatic decision. Now, one of the reasons, motivating reasons for this also is self-preservation. Okay? Why? No food will die. Right? Not only be, long before we die, our cattle will die. Okay? Our cattle, your wealth in those days would have been measured by the sheep and goats that you own, which can grow, right? They multiply, they, they'll actually multiply so they, they, your wealth is actually growing. But now they could lose everything. They themselves could be, would be hungry. And so I want us to realize here that when you get to verse 2, although they intended for it to be a temporary stay, to sojourn there, it became a permanent move. And the name of the man was Elimelech. And the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Marlon and Shilion. Now, so we're introduced to the family members. All right? Where were they from? From the tribe of Okay, Ephrata. Ephratites of Benjamin, Bethlehem, Judah. And notice, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there and they remain and they remain. Now, step one, what did they do? They left. Right? Step two, they came into the country of Moab. Step three, they continued there in Moab, claiming it as home. Step four, one thing led to another because after that it was marrying the Moabite. Okay? Marrying among the women of Moab. And so the family grows. Now we'll look at that one later. But let's look at the family members. A little bit like. Now, look at the names are interesting. Because when you look at his name, it says, My God is King. Think about the, the name, Elimelech, my God is king. Yet, the way he went about making decisions demonstrated God is not his king. Alright? That he is the final authority. When If God is your king, what happens? He will be your final authority. He will be the one that you and I seek to find out, to know what should I do in every turn, in every situation of my life. Alright? Instead, he by doing this, this is contrary to the word of God, contrary, you know, to God's plan, and he decided what was good for him. He's king. Make no mistake about it. What about his wife? His wife, Naomi. This my means my delight. Pleasant. But because of the events that happened in chapter one, she would eventually transform because of the circumstances to someone very different. She would inform everyone later, to tell everyone later that, please call me Mara. Bitter. No longer pleasant, but bitter. Why? Because she had allowed the circumstances to change her. 
It changed the kind of person that she was. Pleasant, delightful, full of joy, into a bitter, angry person. The name of the sons are also interesting. Malon, if you look it up, it means sick or sickly. Right? I don't know why any parent will give that kind of name to their son. But that's the reality. Okay? Chilion means pining. Slowly wasting away. He's not, he is also one sick puppy. He's not well. He's two boys, all right? They're not in the best of health, and now they move away from family, away from relatives and friends and all that to be in Moab, hoping for a better future. Now, think about this. How is it possible for you and I to seek a better future outside of God? Hmm? Now, Christian, how is it possible for you and I to seek a better future, okay, a better ministry, a better uh, hope for our family and all that, better prospects outside of God's plan? You see, there, there can be a grave danger in us taking things into our own hands and figuring things out on our own. And so this became, as I, I mentioned now, this became a permanent decision. And as soon as they, not long after they moved there, things happen. You know, life happens. And when things in life happen, there are things that will happen that are beyond your control and mine. Because in verse 3 we see, tragedy came. Right? The death of Elimelech. Verse 3, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left and her two sons. Right? The one who led in the decision that brought the whole family there, now that now something happened, we, the scriptures don't give us the details as to why he died. But he is no longer around. He is gone. Now, here comes the second problem. Okay, not only did he die, Naomi inherits all the consequences of that decision. Alright? Now, understand this, that you and I will make decisions in life, but many times there will be consequences and there will also be others who will inherit the consequences of a decision. Yeah, Alright? If you have a child who is born here in Cambodia, guess what? They didn't choose to move here. They were here. They were born here. Okay? I didn't make the, the decision to be born in Singapore. Okay? My grandparents did. Alright? My grandfather, when he moved from China, but do you see that we will inherit this, whether you and I like it or not? And then life has to move on. We have to still continue from where, where we are. So here, Naomi is left along with her two sons. Well, it looks like uh, when you go to verse 4 that they cho she chose not to move back home to Israel but to stay on. And so there was the temporary joy when Naomi's two sons got married. Look at verse 4. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. And I shall add contrary to the law of Moses. There were very specific commandments not to do so. But they took took two wives, right? Why? Because, again, pragmatic. What? We're going to go all the we have to travel all the way back to Israel to find wives? Hang on, hang on. Didn't Abraham actually do that? He sent his servant back all the way. He and his, what? He and Isaac, right, did not go back. 
When he sent his servant back, he says to bring a wife for Isaac. Here, they took the wives of the women of Moab, right? Who, by the way, are, if you look up some of the scriptures concerning them, it does come across that they are particularly attractive. Okay? Come on, having a beautiful wife is not a bad thing. And, you know, and, and as the pragmatic reasoning goes, it's okay, you know, uh, even if this is contrary to God's word. Now, you know, marriage, can I say this to, to all the who are single? Marriage is a very good test of how serious you are about following God's final authority in His word. It will really reveal whether you're serious about the word of God or not, or you are a pragmatist. Why? Because in making that decision, you have to choose. Do I f obey what God has to say? And there is always a temptation there that the thought that if I follow God's will and God's plan and His word, it will be at the expense of my happiness. So the bottom line question is this, do you trust God? Right? Do you trust His word or not? Because if you don't, it will show because in your pragmatic decision, you take things into your own hands to ensure your happiness. Do you take the word of God and His word, you know, and, and listen, this, this is very real because uh, we, we can easily have a situation here. Someone will say, well, okay, well, I'm going to get married, Pastor, but uh, I'm going to uh, marry this guy, but uh, he's in a very different church from ours. Right? Doctrine and practice, everything is very different. Oh, wait, wait, we don't even use the same kind of Bible. Bible. But, just to look spiritual, well, I have a duty to follow my husband. Hey, you have a duty to obey the word of God, Amen. all right, and to separate from those who do not follow the same doctrine. All right? You can. You can try to persuade and speak to him to convince him. I said, darling, I want you to meet my pastor. Let, uh, we need to sit down and talk about this because I'm not comfortable about going to that church. Okay? I'm, I'm, I don't know about your situation here or what was happening, but understand this, that even where, from where I come from, we have, to face, we have to deal with this kind of issues all the time. Here, so one married, uh, okay, the, the name of one was Ofa, and the name of the other, Ruth, and they dwelt there about 10 years. Now, remember, to, they wanted to sojourn that now this has become a, more than a 10 year stay. They stayed for an additional 10 years, right? They just got married. Of course, after you got married, you don't want to just pack up and go somewhere else. You want to settle in, whatever. So they decided to stay on, right? Contrary to, uh, as I mentioned, to God's plan. Now, marrying uh, Moabite women, contrary to God's plan. And this was a total disregard of God's laws. Now, Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Do you realize that even if they marry, and the law of Moses made the provision here that in the case that someone should disobey and marry, they are not allowed to even enter into the congregation of the Lord, not into the tabernacle nor the temple. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Do you see how serious this is? God says, not even ten generations down. This is very serious business. And so here, this temporary joy of marriage, right? That was this throwing away of God's laws. And this was a terrible fruit of self will. Right, they left the promised land, they left their inheritance behind, they sold everything, converted it to cash. Do you realize that the land that they were given was to be handed down to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation forever? All right. 
they left behind God's promises. They left the fellowship of other believers. They left their own people to marry unbelievers. And now they want the blessing of God on their lives. How strange. Throwing away of God's laws. All right, it's terrible fruit of self-will. I want to see here the total loss. Because we see in verse 5 the death of Malon and Shilion. It says here, and Malon and Shilion died also both of them, and the woman was left of her husband, her two sons and her husband. Alright? Now, by this point in verse 5, the worst had happened because now not only did Naomi lose her husband, everyone who is of her flesh and blood had died. Right? It's the only one left in her family plus her daughters in law. Three widows. You see how painful that is? Being a widow is one thing. Right? It's bad. But it's okay. I have sons. I have two sons. If they marry, they can have children. I can at least have the joy of my grandchildren. But these two sons died before there were any children. Now, what's going through Naomi's mind? All right, what's the loss like? A loss of a husband, the loss of two sons, the loss of potential grandchildren, the loss of because all these men are gone, the loss of a breadwinner or breadwinners livelihood and support a loss of their dreams all their dreams are gone they had already lost their home in Israel what's there left if she were to go back home as we say in Asia there will be a loss of face She'll be too embarrassed to go home. Alright? Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 30. The Lord Jesus Christ reminds us that we should count the costs when we make a decision. Verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? Alright? Because the job... The issue before all of us is not whether we can start. Understand this, so many of us can start something. How many can finish? I get sick of this because I see this all the time in the ministry. Pastors, missionaries, any, do you realize almost any fool can start the church? Will it still be standing years later? That's the real question. Also, right, you see this and all the missions conferences. Oh, so and so is a veteran missionary, whatever. They started so many churches. What are they like now? Some don't even exist. You can't even find their name anymore. But they are still a successful veteran. Of what? Some are not even in the faith anymore. They don't even stand on you know, important truths. They have moved away. Do you realize many of us can start? Okay, now that was, that, was, that was one of my special abilities. I'm very good at starting stuff. I focused the second half of my life on making sure it can be finished. And especially as pastor, I don't just want to talk about it. I want to make sure that it, 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 we can get it off the ground, up and running, and it will continue. All right? Even if I'm not around. Now, here is this less happily, verse 29. After he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it. Do you see that? You can lay a foundation and not finish building. It says, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. 
Don't start something and walk away and then go and start something else again and walk away and go start something else. Now, I'm not trying to make fun of you if you're doing that or whatever. Like I said, I was very good. I was an expert at doing that. But I had to develop the persistence and the patience to successfully finish all those things I had started. That took the last 30 years of my life. Here, this was devastating because it wasn't just losing two sons anymore. They, by now, Naomi has lost everything. Everything that was precious to her was gone. So I want to move on to the next part because we'll talk about the plan to return home. All right, the plan to return home. Was there a time, a time for to return home? There was, and here, I want to see that something happened. They, there was the hearing of testimonies concerning God's faithfulness in Israel. All right, look at verse six. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. Why? For notice the word for it means because for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Now something amazing had happened and the news spread and went from Israel all the way even to Moab. And what was that? That it says here that the Lord had visited his people in their time of need during the famine and in gave, giving them bread. And now she makes a decision. All right, she arose with her daughters-in-law. Why? So that she might return from the country of Moab. Now, it was the right decision to move home, to go home, to go back to Israel. All right, to go. Now, this issue is not, uh, let me clarify this. This issue is not about whether to go home back to the Philippines or whatever. This or, or back to Singapore or, or whatever country we came from. The issue was this, to go back to where the presence of God is. Right? The place of worship. And where God has been dealing with us and working in us. Okay? She saw how in Israel the Lord had visited his people. You see that? And there were testimonies of that. That's how she heard about it. Right? Make sure you and I also, you know, we, we pray for things to happen and God answers and there is a breakthrough, whatever. But don't forget, not just our thankfulness, but to share the true testimonies of the Lord, how what He had done in our lives. Because why? Sometimes somebody else needs to know. Someone needs to be reminded about this. And here was someone who was out of the will of God, right? And it's in a bad situation. Now she is reminded God has always remained faithful to his people. And it's working on her. Now, because of that, there was a decision to return home. Verse 7, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, right? In Moab. And she and her two daughters-in-law with her. Notice, they agreed to go along with her back to Israel. And they went on the way to return onto the land of Israel, onto the land of Judah. So what happens now? She makes a decision to go back. Her two daughters-in-law agreed. They packed up. They all went back together. All right, they went on their way. It wasn't just good intentions. They didn't just think about it. They got up, they did, took everything with them, and they were moving. They actually got, onto the, got on the road. Now, we see this was not something unfamiliar because we all know what happened with the prodigal son. And the prodigal son had to first come to himself, come to his own senses before he could make a decision. Luke 15, verse 15 to 19. 
It says, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Verse 16, and he were faint and filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, notice that, he came to himself. There he was in the midst, right, of the mud, the slop, and all that, and it's stinking and filthy and with the flies and all that. And he's trying to compete with the pigs for food. He's trying to steal their food, by the way. Stealing from his employer. And he's sitting there and he came to himself. What am I doing here? What is all this? Right? He said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now, I want to see here there was a change of heart. There was a change of mind. Now many falsely define repentance as just a change of heart. If that was the case, the prodigal son would have said, you know, he came to himself and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare and I perish if hunger <laughs> and he will sit there and do nothing why? you can have a change of heart and you still don't think that I need to turn back this is not works because the prodigal son had to get up he arose and went home humbled himself and went back to his father what the father will do no idea He's going to have to put himself at the mercy of his father. All right? He was planning to offer that, you know what, I don't even need to come back as a son. Just, just let me come back as a servant. But you realize it's up to, entirely up to the father to accept or reject him. Many have remorse and regret and they will still sit there with the pigs in tears years later never having the right the humility to get up and to go back to turn their back and say you know what I need to throw myself at God's mercy Naomi now has to make the decision she made the decision to return home knowing that when she goes back to her hometown everyone is going to be talking about her and asking her questions. And you know what? There are times that you and I have to just turn back to the Lord, eat our pride, and say, Lord, I'm coming home. Gone on my own way. And this is a, it's very much in our fallen nature. Right? We're told, all we like sheep, have gone astray. We've gone every turn, every man, his own way. And man, can I point out, sometimes we have, even after we're saved, we have a stubborn tendency to want to insist on our own way and it terrifies our wives. It terrifies our wives. Now, the steps towards turning home. First, we must realize, right, that the kind of situation we are in. I don't know what, is, what the situation is for everyone here. Some of you here may be running from God. Right? Some of you here may be here because you ran away from a situation back home. Some of you are still running, even if you can loudly say amen, because deep down, you really don't want the Word of God to penetrate too deeply. Because it will reveal certain things you don't want to see. Alright? 
I have difficulty with a lot of things in the scriptures. Why? Because it tells me things I don't want to hear. But I have to deal with. But there is also has to be a realization that things must change. Naomi understood that. We cannot continue, continue like this. Things must change. Right? And she realized we have to do something instead of just remaining here. Okay? Because her husband died. And after her husband died, you know, they tried to make the best of the situation. Many times we do this in church also. It's like, well, we really can't be helped. You know, well, things are like that. You know, uh, it's just the way things are in this church, whatever. Uh, really, things can't be helped. And so we just try to put up with it. Sometimes we put up with things in the marriage. Right, this just can't be helped. You know, my husband's like this or my wife's like that. And, and, and there's never, we've already decided ahead of time there's no possibility of change and Naomi makes this decision that she needs to go back to where God wants her to be alright the decision is never just about going back or not it is about it really has to do not so much with a place as in we need to be where God needs us to be. You see what I'm saying here? Now, years back, okay, and I, I think probably we may have to, this will be the part one already. Years back, I found myself in that situation. Okay? My dream had always been someday. I will get to work and live in Silicon Valley. It happened. The company I work for in Singapore, right, uh, sent me up there to be part of a management team in our West Coast office. I was in the San Francisco Bay Area. Not only that, the door opened. Uh, when I went, it wasn't just me. The government agency that my wife worked for said, Oh, your husband is going there? Okay, we will create a position for you over there. And she went up there too. So we were together. Right? We worked, we worked there. Our first child was born there. Wow. Also, things were moving. Things were finally happening. Nine years of waiting for a child. Finally, we have a child. Oh, we, we, we have a chance now to file the application for a green card. In fact, actually, if I move across from the West Coast to the East Coast, I could get another 30% more. Life was good. We were in a good church. But because we were in a good church, the Lord brought us there temporarily to ground us such that we were growing and learning about things that we had nev nobody had ever told us before. Dearly beloved, you don't know what a blessing it is to be in a church like that where you have a pastor that cares enough to tell you stuff from the Bible, not from his opinion, that many churches will never even mention. And we were learning, we were like, huh, how come nobody ever told us this before? And I was there, I realized, in hindsight now, I was there because right, the Lord was dealing with me. The stubborn fool that I was. And it was during the time that, I won't go into all the details, maybe another night, right, where he broke that stiff neck fool of me and my stubbornness. That from that point on, I gave myself to him completely, not holding anything back. Otherwise, I would not be in the ministry today. But it was on one particular Sunday, I remember, because I had come back. I went back to Singapore for a number of months. I came back and I told everyone, you know, we're coming back to the West Coast, right? Our apartment and everything is still there. Even my cat was still there. And we're going to pack up and we're going to move back to Singapore. Why? Because 
uh, I've already set up a new company and we now as soon as I arrived there and I did make one decision before that which was it became my new policy that whenever I travel before I it used to be I will arrive in the evening have a good dinner sleep wake up in the morning boom I'm in a meeting at 7 30 or 8 30 or whatever it is in the morning all right having traveled across the world I'm in a totally different time zone I'll hit the ground running and I my new policy uh, when I was later on when I was working there was this I will arrive on a Friday so that the first place I step into is church not the office and I did that even when at that point I was up, uh, already had set up my own company I went in to church and on the Sunday evening we're studying through the life of Jacob All right, and we got to the chapter where Jacob God tells Jacob it's time to go home what happened was this what the Lord dealt with me about was I finally the light bulb came out I'm sitting there I was like wait a minute the Lord did bring me over there for a reason okay I, I understood that there was there will be a need for me to return home to Singapore I, I was very clear on the Lord's leading but that evening what hit me was the question why are you going back it is not where the where was settled it was a matter of time that I would go back to Singapore the question was for what reason I searched. I immediately that evening after the invitation, I asked my pastor. I said, "Can you? Can I meet with you?" I met with him with our de head deacon. They had dinner in my place. We prayed. We prayed for the will of God to make His will clear. Two weeks later, the one of the rare times I went rare times I went into the office early because. The traffic is really so bad it's not it's pointless actually trying to go in early I, I usually work from home first and then I'll drive in okay it takes half, one and a half hours to drive in when if the traffic is clear it takes 20 minutes now that day I not only got in early I got in yeah I, only, I got in early as soon as I got in the phone rang I went into the conference room and then senior vice president from New York says Jesse I'm very, very, very sorry. I tried my best. They made me do this. I didn't want this at all. He says, they're letting you go. Fired. For no reason. I was alone in the conference room and I smiled. You know why? I've been praying. I knew the answer had come. It was not the answer I would have preferred. Okay, understand that. As I smiled, inwardly, as I prayed in silence, I was like, Lord, you have answered. I recognize that. But ouch. You could have picked a better way of answering that prayer because I've never been fired before. I had people begging me to start a new company with them. Right? I be, have people beg me to work for them okay? and I, I, I'm the sort that I pick my boss I don't, not the other way around I choose who I work for and here I said Lord my pride hurts but I will honour you because I know this is the answer and I will continue to seek out your direction because I still don't know what's next okay but understand sometimes and I'm pointing this out okay, from, from hard experience that sometimes you can know that okay here's the destination but why it's just as important and that was the part that I had been searching but two weeks of praying the answer came I got fired for no reason they could not give me a reason okay and we continued praying on until the Lord made it very clear because after that it was about um, when that happened actually it would be a whole year later before the Lord made it very clear 
in the middle of the second week of revival meetings, in church again, that it became very clear. He's not interested in whatever I'm currently doing. It's all gone. And he wants something else. The last thing that I was prepared to do. Because for a whole year, I've been praying, Lord, here am I. You can use me. But what that night I realized I had this other hand behind my back saying, just don't ask me to be a pastor. Anything but that. And that night, that ha- the Lord looked at that and says, that hand, that's the one I want. I'm not interested in the others. I'm not in this, interested in the stuff that you're comfortable in offering to me. I'm interested in the one, the last thing that you're prepared to do, to pastor and to preach. Because honestly, I did not have it in me to be able to stand in front of a group of people and all that and to do this. So I was wrestling all this time. I said, no, no, no. I don't want that. No, don't make me do that. And I, and I mentioned to you, simultaneously, my wife was praying that we would you know, follow his leading and all that. All right? And by the way, there was already an open offer to come on to support, to be in a supporting role in a ministry in America. And the Lord was, and she was praying and saying, just don't ask me to be a pastor's wife. Okay? Now, the circumstances were actually favorable. I could remain there and all that. Okay? And to be in a a ministry position, but, and that was already an open offer on the table. But, you see, he's not interested in what you are able and prepared to do just because you're comfortable or you can do it in the strength of your own flesh. I knew, I understood why. Because when that happened, it was years later that, uh, I think it was in 2008 or 2009, in the first ever pastor's conference that I was invited to preach. Okay? And I did preach alongside with the twin brother of Paul Chapel. That at the last day, when I was leaving with my bags, it was as if the, there was a voice that pointed this thing to, to me. Do you know why all these years I did not allow you to graduate from a Bible school? Okay? Surprise, surprise. I have never graduated. I never enrolled in one. Okay? I've been trained in Bible institutes. I've been trained under my pastor. I did a lot of study. I trained, you know, I've learned from a lot of good men. But the answer became very clear that, that morning. It says, your pride would have led you to not just one degree, but the next one, and the next one, a PhD. And eventually, you'll be no longer useful at all. And that was very clear to me. I know there are missionaries who refuse to shake my hands once they find out I never graduated from a school. It's okay. But it doesn't matter as long as we are right where God wants us to be and He is using us there. And when it's time to move, we let Him decide that for us and move us. And that's why, you see, it wasn't just where or even when. I knew the where, I knew the when. What was not clear was the why. And that night, once that was settled, I knew I was going back it wasn't because of the new company and business that I set up. I was going to actually have to walk away from all that. And then to walk in and transfer my membership to a church where I would seek out a pastor who was willing to train me because I had just surrendered to be a pastor. You see how dangerous it is here for Naomi's family, they moved because the circumstances changed and it was not favorable. But if you're in the place where God wants you to be, it is His business to provide and to take care of our needs. Alright? And it is not for us to try to second guess. Now, 
So in doing so, what happens? This led to a series of events where it was tragic and painful for Naomi. Right? Painful, why? Because they lost, she, she lost everything in the process. And just when she thought, okay, we, it's okay, we stay here, we remain here, but you know what? I'll, I've got, I still have two sons. As long as they marry, they have children, where I can enjoy the grandchildren, we can still restore some joy even out of this whole mess. But what happens? Both die. And now she's just left with two widows to support, and she's a widow. Okay? So as we kind of. Before we take our break here, I just want to point out to every one of us here now, how many of us today recognize maybe I have, may not have made the best of decisions in my life. And we are where we are now. And understand this, be wise and discerning enough to know, okay, if w whatever led me to here, to Siem Reap, but I'm here now, right? I'm rooted, anchored in a good church. This is a place where I can grow. Then stay where I am until the Lord makes very clear what is next. But understand that the time that we are here, all right, this could be what the Lord is going to do to prepare us for the journey. Are you prepared for the journey? Because so many times we are focused on the destination, but not on the process and that journey. And that process and journey is what What's going to happen is this. God is going to have to work on the person who has to make the journey. On you. Right? Men, on you, or on your wife, on your children, everyone. But, you see, we were so focused on the result, we forget that process, that journey, that road is important. Now, we're going to see here that in the book of Ruth, that journey and that process took four chapters plus a series of events because it was not completed just because she moved back to Israel. There's more to it. There are things that will have to happen. But like Naomi, some of us here, maybe today, we may have to come to be honest with God to realize, you know what? I'm not well. Spiritually, I have not been well. I've been in the very bad shape. I'm broken. And, I was, and a missionary reminded me, reminded me this years ago, you know, if the things that we need to make decisions are broken inside, you're not in a position to make important decisions. You need to spiritually heal, get well, so that you can make the right decisions. Okay? And you will be sure of one thing, the time to move, God will make it clear. God made it clear. When He made it clear for me that there was a time to move on and, that, and, and as to at least the beginning of what's next, I got fired. Got fired from my job. For no reason. Okay? The legal settlement for this, that whole incident would not be settled for, it will not be resolved for another three years. Okay? Which, by the way, I won the legal settlement. I only wanted to get paid. In the end, I got paid double. I wasn't suing them for money. I mean, to, to get rich. I just wanted to get paid so that I can come home. Okay? But, so the Lord even then had to find a way to get us back home. But we need to realize, some of us here, if we're broken inside, you know, the best thing to do is to be where under the counsel and the preaching of God's word that I can get better. And once I get better, be sure of one thing, if it's time to go somewhere else or to move, the Lord will be the one to do it. Okay? I just want to leave some thoughts here. We'll, we'll continue after the break. Let's pray. Father.